design and materials and engineering. Inside the module, we're going to be looking at materials selection and properties in engineering. We're going to be looking at seven materials this morning. Bricks, concrete, aerated concrete blocks, cement, metals, timber, and plastics. The first thing we're going to be looking at is bricks. Elements of clay bricks, class A brick, class B brick, common bricks. What is brick made up of? Yes, they have components of clay. Is there another thing? Remember that bricks, they are natural materials. Who will tell me why this topic is important in engineering? To determine the correct materials to use, to understand the materials to use. In engineering, whether it's mechanical, whether it is civil engineering, whether it's fabrication, anything. If you don't understand engineering materials, it's not even possible for you to do anything. If you want to select materials to design an electrical circuit, you have to understand materials. Brick here is a natural material. Bricks were used before the Romans. To tell you that brick is an ancient natural material. The brick we have today is not different from the brick that was ever used in any generation. The Romans introduced firing of bricks. So why do you think firing of brick is important? What does it do to the brick? Yes. Romans introduced firing of bricks to increase strength. Do you know that today we still fire bricks? using modern methods what is the modern method of firing brick you need to pass brick through fire in our modern method we usually use what what is this what is it now i want you to use your phone google it what is this is what oven you pass brick through the kiln to strengthen the brick brick is made up of what sand clay and lime because of the introduction of concrete some bricks are made from concrete clay bricks clay bricks contains chalk they contain magnesium oxide they contain iron oxide they contain alumina which is al2o3 and this is the chemical composition of alumina they contain silica and this is the chemical composition of silica. They also contain natural minerals. It is important to know some chemical compositions and properties of these materials. Do you know it helps us to understand how these materials react to the environment and how it will react when we actually use it every day? If you don't know the chemical components of it, is it good for you to use it for structures? Because human beings are going to live in it. You ensure that the chemical compositions are not going to be a danger to human health we have class a engineering brick and we also have class b engineering brick class a engineering brick have a strength of 17 newton per millimeter squared while class b got this is class a engineering brick and this is class b engineering brick have you ever gone through a tunnel that is made up of bricks have you gone through a flyover that is made up of bricks those bricks are class a engineering bricks you can use class a engineering bricks even some class b engineering bricks for ground works manholes sewers retaining walls and dam proof courses so anything that will give additional strength to the structure if you want to use bricks class a engineering bricks are highly recommendable external beauty of a house the external bricks most often are class b engineering bricks for the external aesthetic beauty of the building have you ever passed through a house that is made up of bricks and outside is very beautiful that's class b most often this is a manhole isn't it most of this work are usually class a engineering bricks these are common bricks where can you use common bricks in construction fences garden because they are cheap they are cheaper than class a and class b engineering bricks so you don't waste your money check garden fences they are common bricks you don't go and waste money buying 
class A, class B engineering bricks just because you want to do small things in your garden or you want to fence front of your entrance door. So if you want to do things like boundaries, use common bricks. Now we are done with bricks. We're going to look at concrete briefly. Concrete. What is concrete? Components of concrete. An example of concrete mix. And what is a good water cement ratio? When we mention concrete, concrete is made up of cement, aggregates, sand, or gravel, and water. You know what a cement is? When we put cement, aggregates, sand, and water, it is called concrete. What do we use concrete for? Concrete is a binder. Concrete glue aggregates together. For a typical concrete mix, for a strip foundation, for a two-story building, is one bag of cement, three bags of fine aggregates, six bags of coerced aggregates. For a two-story building, this is story one, and this is story two. And we want to use a strip foundation for this building. A strip foundation targets only the walls of the structure. To be able to mix concrete for that building, two-story building, you are going to need every one bag of cement. We need three bags of fine aggregates and six bags of coarse aggregates. If the building is more than two-story building, this is no longer adequate. A good water cement ratio is between 0.4 to 0.8. 0.3 will be difficult to compact and will be dry. There are two methods in civil engineering and construction that can be used to determine water cement ratio. They are mixing by volume and mixing by mass. You are going to use these two methods often to determine water cement ratio for all your concrete mix. Next, we're going to be looking at aerated concrete blocks. This is aerated concrete blocks. Can you see little holes in it? If you cut it, you're going to see little holes. They are blocks that have little pores in them. So we are going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of this, where they are used. Let's talk about the good of this when it comes to fire. If you use aerated blocks for load bearing walls, any load bearing structure, aerated blocks should have at least two hours fire resistance if it is a load bearing structure. If it is used for a non load bearing structure, it should be able to resist the fire up to four hours. This is the standard. Aerated blocks they contain numerous tiny air pockets. They can be used for internal walls. That's, they can be used for internal wall partitioning. They can also be used for external walls. They can be used for foundations. They can be used for suspended concrete floors. They are usually light gray in color. Aerated blocks are non-combustible. They are resistant to sulfate attack. They are light in weight when compared to bricks, stones, or dense concrete blocks. Aerated blocks are usually 100 millimeters thick, having 40 decibels. They are 80% recycled materials. They are manufactured from sand, lime, PFA, pulverized fuel ash, and cement. You can also add aluminum powder. Aluminum powder is added to the mix. The aluminum powder will react with the cement to form bubbles of hydrogen gas. Despite the beauty of aerated concrete blocks, it absorbs water a lot. It also has high thermal insulation. What do you think will happen if you use this 
a rated concrete block for ceiling. If you use it for roof or use it for outer roofing, it's going to absorb water. And what do you think will happen over time? So despite its advantages, you should know where to use it in construction and where not to use it. One good thing about aerated concrete blocks, if you use it for partitioning your internal rooms, is that it allows for airflow in the building. It allows for breathable building. Let's look at cement. Cement is made up of clay or shale. And it's also made up of limestone or chalk. These materials are taken to a cement manufacturing plant. It will undergo a lot of processes, which are complex process, to finally give us a cement. Cement is made up of clay or shale. The components are silica, alumina, and iron oxide. Cement is also made up of limestone or chalk. Limestone from hard rock. Chalk is from soft rock. These are types of cement according to the European standard, EN197. We have the first class of cement known as Portland cement. The next class is Portland composite cement. The third class is blast furnace cement. The fourth class is pozzolanic cement. And the fifth class is composite cement. Next, let's look at metals. Metals can be used in the construction industry. It can be used for mechanical devices like gears, for example. Metals can be used for machine parts. We can use it to design robots. Metals is just everywhere. Boot, not steels. We use even in the construction site is from metals. Metals are divided into two. We have ferrous metals. Ferrous metals contains iron. We have non-ferrous metals. They contain no iron. Ferrum is a Latin word for iron. In chemistry, or when we want to write the chemical composition of iron, we use Fe as a symbol, which represents ferrum. So ferrum is a Latin word. Iron is an English word. Let's look at ferrous metals. What did I tell you about ferrous metal? I said they contain what? Iron. They contain iron. They are pure iron, cast iron, wrought iron, other various types of steel. We have mild steel. Mild steel can be used for bridges, dams, tunnels, buildings, and different construction projects. Pure iron. Pure iron are soft and malleable. Do you know what my level is? What is my level? You can change the shape. However, they are unsuitable for many engineering applications. Pure iron mixed with carbon is known as what? Alloy. And is good for some engineering work. And is good for some construction work. Even many other engineering applications. Range of metal alloys containing iron and 0.08% to 1.2% carbon by weight is known as steel. So you see, we talk of iron, but you mix the iron with what? Some other things. Purify it. It can be what? Steel. This addition of carbon will increase the strength and hardness of steel, but at a cost. It will reduce the toughness and ductility of the steel. We say that steel is a low carbon steel when it contains 0.15% of carbon. When we say that steel is a mild steel, mild steel contains 0.15% to 0.25% of carbon. For medium steel, Medium steel contains 0.25% to 0.5% of carbon. High steel materials contains 0.5% to 1.5% of carbon. Structural steel, steel that we use in the construction industry. Many of them contain 0.04% of phosphorus, 0.04% of sulfur, 0.55% of copper, 1.5% of manganese and 0.21% of carbon. You see, this is steel. We can use this for what? Any engineering application. This is structural steel. Look at the composition. 
Some other elements have been added to this for it to become a construction steel material. Stainless steel, you have a lot of them in your houses, right? You have a lot of them in your kitchen. How many of you use spoon yesterday or today to eat? Yes, this is it. You use your fork and knife, spoon, this is it. The stainless steel contains sulfur, silicon, carbon, manganese, chromium, nickel, phosphorus. Are you understanding the variation that needs to be made to just change the metal to something else? This table summarizes materials and carbon content for different steel. We are done with ferrous materials. For non-ferrous metals, they are copper, lead, aluminium, zinc, a lot of them. They are called non-ferrous metals. Most of these can conduct what? Electricity. Let's look at timber. What is the difference between a wood and a timber? Timber is from tree. A felled mature tree is known as wood. When you cut down a tree that is mature, you are cutting down what? Wood. After seasoning, what is seasoning of a wood? When you cut down a wood, it contains moisture. You dry it out. After seasoning, cut into sizes and the moisture content reduced to be called timber. You see when we now call it timber. So that's why you hear more of timber structure. They are woods cut. You now cut it into sizes, pass it through seasoning to reduce the moisture content. And it is now known as timber. So timbers usually come from hardwood or from softwood. For hardwood, they are usually from deciduous trees. And for softwoods, they are usually from evergreen trees. Plastics. Let's quickly look at plastics. Plastics are divided into two types. Thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. Did you have plastic on your phone? Yes, that's plastic. So plastic is just all around us. Plastics are organic substances containing carbon and hydrogen. Any organic substance containing carbon and hydrogen most often are known as hydrocarbons. Plastics contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine, and nitrogen. From plastic, we have drain pipes. When rain falls, what happens? Plastics collect all the waters and channel it off, isn't it? Most windows, internal doors, and softboard cladding and so on are all made up of plastics. Thermoplastic. I told you they are made up of what? Two types, isn't it? Thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. Let's look at thermoplastics. Thermoplastics are plastics that can be melted down. If you can melt plastic, when you cool the plastic down, they are not going to change their properties. Thermoplastics will not change their properties when they are melted down. Thermoplastics can be remolded. You can remold thermoplastics. They are inflammable at high temperature. Examples of thermoplastics are PVC pipes. PVC pipes are thermoplastics. So example of thermoplastics, we have polyethylene, we have polystyrene, and a lot of them. Thermosetting plastics. Thermosetting plastics are stronger than thermoplastics. They have high resistance to abrasion. Once hardened, cannot be melted and remolded. Your drinking bottle in front of you, is it thermoplastics or thermosetting plastics? Check example of thermoplastics. This thermoplastic can be remolded. Thermoplastic settings, they cannot after you melt them down. This did not say it cannot be melted, but it cannot be melted and remolded. If you melt this drinking bottle down now, can you remold it back? Thermosettings are brittle materials. They can break easily if you add more force to them, isn't it? Can you easily break PVC pipes? No. So you see that thermosetting plastics are stronger than thermoplastics.